Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Christ is in our midst. Today's epistle is very beautiful, and it is full, and I wanted to read it briefly, um, that our hearts might be touched by it, even though we just heard it. It is good to hear and to let it sort of sink in and touch our hearts. Brethren, God, who is rich in mercy, out of the great love with, with which he loved us, even when we were dead through our trespasses, he made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved, and raised us up with him, and made us to sit with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the coming ages he might show his immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For grace you have been saved through faith, and this not your own doing, it is the gift of God. When we talk to God, we pray. But God speaks to us primarily through his word by the Holy Spirit. And so it is helpful for us when we hear the scriptures to let them sink in, let them touch our hearts, and to think about them and what they mean for us. Now, I'm not going to talk about that because the gospel today is so rich, perhaps richer than I can, um, I guess that's a pun, isn't it? Um, perhaps richer than I'm able to uh, really speak to. But I'm going to make three assumptions before I start. And I'll let you know what they are. Assumptions about you and me and, and how we approach this rather challenging piece of scripture. I'm going to make the assumption, three of them actually, that you love God. That you desire eternal life, just like the man in the gospel. And I'll make the assumption that we are all wealthy. Now the first two you probably had no trouble with. But we tend to balk when we think of ourselves as wealthy. Because we live in a culture which is obsessed with wealth. And we ourselves, of course, know and hear about people who are far wealthier than we are, so how could we possibly be wealthy? When we take a good look at ourselves and our lives, for the most part, most of us, by the world standards, are quite wealthy. And so I'll, I'll instead of trying to convince you that you're wealthy, I'll just make that an assumption and a base, base principle for what I, what I hope to say today. The last time I spoke to you, I mentioned uh, that we are spiritually all in the same boat. That is, that we all hunger for the visitation of the grace of God. But financially, we're not all in the same boat. We all have boats, but they're different boats. And that represents the different degrees of our wealth. We're all wealthy, but there are different degrees of our wealth. And that is largely independent of what we have done in ourselves. It's an accident of our birth, of the education that we were raised in, and some choices that we made back before. Now forgive me, it is difficult and uh, not comfortable to talk about money, to talk about our finances. Funny in a culture that is so obsessed with wealth, that's one thing we never talk about. How much money we make, how much money we spend, that's a private matter. And it's true. But the Lord speaks to us through his scriptures a lot about money and about what our relationship should be to this, to this wealth that we have. So forgive me for making these presumptions. But, and forgive me also for creating any awkward feelings as I try to um, unpack, if I may, this gospel. So, in this gospel, we meet what is usually called the rich young ruler. 
This gospel is told in both in all three of the Synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, all have almost the exact same story with some minor details. And since we already heard the gospel according to St. Luke, I will talk a little bit about what is in the gospel according to St. Mark, which is essentially the same thing with a couple other pieces. It says that as the disciples were setting out on their journey, a man ran up and knelt before Christ and asked him, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? He is not one of the Pharisees trying to tempt him, trying to trick him into saying some answer. This person genuinely wants to know. He is sincere. And Jesus says to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. Now, he says this to show us and the, the rich young ruler, that perhaps he doesn't know who he's speaking to. Only God is good. Are you calling me God? You know the commandments, do not murder, do not commit adultery, do not steal, do not bear false witness, do not defraud, honor your father and mother. And in the Gospel of Matthew, he adds, love your neighbor as yourself. And he says to him, teacher, all these things I have kept from my youth. And it says in Mark, Jesus, looking at him, loved him. And he said to him, you lack one thing. Go sell all that you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. And come, follow me. Disheart disheartened, the young man went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. Then Jesus, it says in Gospel of Mark, he said to his disciples, how difficult will it be for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. His disciples were amazed at his words. But Jesus said to them again, children, how difficult it is to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. And they were exceedingly astonished and said to him, then who can be saved? And Jesus looked at them and said, with man it is impossible, but not with God. With God all things are possible. Now what are we to do with this? And how do we hear the Lord speak to us through this event, not a parable. We live, as I said, in a rich, wealthy culture. We have very high standards of living, high expectations of our own comfort and ease. Most of us, perhaps, have more than we need. And this gospel is telling us that our wealth is or can be a real impediment to our salvation, to us entering in and following Christ. Now, I thought I would enlist Blessed Theophilact, who wrote many commentaries on the Gospels, and see what he says about this, rather than sounding like my opinions. Blessed Theophilact was a scholar in Constantinople in the 11th century, who then later reluctantly left his, his uh, home in um, Constantinople and traveled to Bulgaria, or is now Bulgaria, and uh, served the uh, leading hierarch there. So here's what it says. What does the Lord mean? First, that this statement is true. It is impossible for a rich man, while he is a rich man, to be saved. Now remember, I started off with the assumption that all of us have to consider that we are rich and that we need to hear this from that perspective. It is impossible for a rich man, while he is a rich man, to be saved. Do not say to me that such and such a rich man gave away his riches and was saved. He was not saved as a rich man, 
he was saved either as a man who had attained non-possession or who had become a steward, but not as a rich man. Now, a steward and a rich man are not the same. The rich man keeps riches for himself, while the steward, as a trustee, holds wealth for the benefit of others. Therefore, if such a man is saved, he is not saved as a rich man, but as we have said, because he has either given all that he has away, or because he has spent his wealth as a good steward. Consider this well. While it is impossible for a rich man to be saved, it is not impossible, but only difficult for them who have riches to be saved. It is as if the Lord had said, the rich man who is possessed by his riches and is a slave to them and is held fast by them shall not be saved. But he who only has riches, that is, who is a master or a steward of those riches, owning them without being owned by them, well, he shall be saved with difficulty. So what are we to do with this and take this? Well, if you were able to follow along in the reading, we are not to be owners of our wealth. We are not to be rich men, but we are rather to be stewards. If we are to be fit for the kingdom, we must learn to be stewards of all of the wealth and all of the riches that we have. Now, what does that mean? That means for us to see that all of the wealth that we have is God's. It does not belong to us. It has been given to us in our care for the benefit of others. But what others? Well, our family, of course. We have to be responsible for those the Lord has given us but also to our church, to the poor, and to anyone who we see as need, or anyone, as the scripture says, who asks of us. Now, it is a fine line between being rich and being a steward, between owning and managing. You can see the predicament we're in and how we can easily play games with ourselves and convince ourselves that we are, while we are, in fact, possessed by our riches, possessed by our wealth, possessed by our money, that we are, in fact, stewards when we're not. So what does it mean to be a good steward? For us, I think, ideally, it means for us to offer up all that we are and all that we have to God, recognizing that every single thing that we have is from God. Now you'll recognize the word steward because soon or before you have received a little thing called a stewardship card. And so here's a great place to start in our stewardship, is our stewardship to the church. When Sandy and I were first married, her parents um, offered to show us how they budgeted. And of course, being young and with our first jobs, actually not even having our first jobs, they offered to show us how they budgeted, how they kept track of their spending. Essentially, how they offered their livelihood up to God. And they said to us, first of all, we think you should tithe. Now, to tithe means to give a tenth part. They said 10% right off the top. Now, this is a scriptural tradition that was embedded in the law and the culture of the Jews. Honor the Lord with your wealth, with the first fruits of all you produce. And the tithe was understood as 10% of all that you have, pr have produced or all of your income, right off the top before taxes. Forgive me. Here's where it gets uncomfortable, where I start telling you what to do with your money. So I, I don't mean to do that. Tenny's parents told us that they 
though they did not ever have big incomes. They said, we have tithed the first fruits of what we have made, 10% off the top before taxes, and we have never lacked for anything. Raising four kids who all went to college and they were able to retire. So we took the, the, the advice and we can say that we have never lacked for anything, quite the contrary. Now one measure of whether we are stewards is how easily we are able to part with our wealth. Now for some of us, 10% of our income would seem impossible. We can't do that. We're stretched. All of our money is, is tied up. We can't afford that. And forgive me, our giving is a matter of our faith, but it's also a matter of our history. We may be bound by decisions we've made in the past that will not allow us at this time to tithe. Now, tithing 10% is not a legalistic amount. Forgive me. It's a place to start. And it's a way to measure for ourselves whether we are rich, that is bound to our riches, or whether we are stewards, whether we see that all things that we have are indeed God's. And so when we give that tenth part back, then we can prove to ourselves and to God that on some level we are trying at least not to be bound to our riches. Now, while it may seem impossible, and it maybe is impossible for us, or at least very difficult, maybe we could try, and maybe we could work towards that. We step out in faith, and we test our faith. Forgive me, this is not an appeal for funding anything. God does not need or desire your money. The church will thrive with or without your tithe, or without any of your offerings by his grace and by his providence. But our Lord Jesus desires our freedom. He did not tell the rich young ruler to give all of his money to the poor and follow me, follow Christ, because he wanted to put a big hurdle in front of him, but because he loved him and he saw in his life that he was bound to his riches in a way that would prevent him from living in relationship to Christ. And this is the question we can ask ourselves. How are our finances binding us in a way that prevents us from living free in Christ? St. Paul says, for freedom you have been made free. Now we know that we have been made free from our sins by Christ. Free for what? To be free to follow him, to serve him. Now, most of you are familiar with the term the cheerful giver, or the saying that God loves the cheerful giver. This is from Paul's second letter to the Corinthians. He says, remember this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Each of you should give what you have decided to give in your hearts, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to bless you abundantly so that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, you will abound to every good work. Forgive me if I made anybody uncomfortable or, or I helped anybody pat themselves on the back because you're already tithing your 10%. The, the 10%, the percentage doesn't matter. It's just that we need to show ourselves to ourselves and to God that we are free and that we are truly stewards of our wealth. It's interesting that this gospel comes at a time where we have a day of thanksgiving, where we thank God for everything we have, and then many of us go in, on Black Friday and spend much of that we were thankful for. And then we have 
small business Saturday or something, and then Monday has got a name. It's Cyber Monday. Cyber Monday. And then Tuesday, last but not least, is Giving Tuesday. Interesting. Is this the order we have in our lives? Spending then giving? Or is our giving a forethought? See, our giving shouldn't be a, an afterthought. Our stewardship is the mindfulness that is the, the premeditated act, the desire to give, to give back a portion of what God has given us in thanksgiving. Our Lord gave us a command. Give to everyone who asks from you. So if I may, I'm going to offer you another way in which you can test yourself to see your freedom from bondage to our wealth and to our riches. And that is in our almsgiving. When we have an, when we have an opportunity for alms, giving alms, do we unhesitatingly pull out our money, write our checks, or do we have to go and have we not planned ahead to give? Now, of course, giving to everyone that asks for you, homeless people on the street, organizations um, of various charities, some would say it calls for discernment. And others would say it calls for radical generosity. C.S. Lewis, famously, a story is told of him. He's walking down a street with one of his literary companions. And a beggar asks him for some money. And C.S. Lewis reaches in his pocket and gives him some money. And his friend says to him, you know he's just going to go buy beer with it. And C.S. Lewis says, well, that's what I was going to do with it. <laughs> So we're not called to be the judge of people who are asking for us, money from us. But since we are stewards of that which God has given us, the money in our wallet does not belong to us. But it belongs to the person who asks for it if we're to obey Christ's command to give to everyone who asks from us. Some of you are you familiar with Abbot Trifon of the monastery up on uh, Bashan Island, and he has provided a solution, his personal solution to the problem of choosing how much money to give to a person. In his cassock pocket, and he gets asked quite a bit, being a clergyman, I think he's an easy mark, I guess, um, he has folded identically $5 bills, $10 bills, and $20 bills. I don't know in what pr proportion. And when someone asks him for money, he doesn't have to decide how much money to give that person based on looking them over and seeing what they are likely to do with it. He reaches into his cassock pocket and he pulls out. And whatever, the, whatever bill comes out is what the person gets. This seems to me to be uh, an act of freedom. Now, he has another layer of freedom. He's a monk and has already given everything, essentially. My point is that we need to plan to give. How many times have people asked us, and we're like, well, I don't have any money. I, I would, but I don't have any money with me. Well, it's because we weren't being intentional in our giving, prayerful. And I should say that, above all, our financial area, our financial life should not be an area that does not fall under our prayers. How often do our confessions have anything to do with our personal economies? But perhaps it should. Perhaps we should consider that prayer should cover all aspects of our lives. If God is going to speak to us through the scriptures about our money, perhaps we should speak to him about our money and ask him what he wants us to do with it and how. Our brothers and sisters in Christ, 
I said this is not an appeal for funding anything, but this is an appeal for all of us to take the words of the Lord seriously, especially those that are hard words, to wrestle with them, to find out what they really mean to us. We need to put our faith into action. Faith requires action. Wealth, riches, to any degree that we have, is a test for us or it's a trap for us. Jesus says how hard it is for those who have riches to enter into life. He didn't say that it was easy for poor people. Jesus, actually St. Paul says, by much tribulation we must enter the kingdom. Our Lord loves us and he has done everything for our salvation. He's already done it. The the epistle today puts it in past tense that he has set us with him in the heavenly places. He doesn't want our money. He wants our hearts. So Jesus told us where our treasure is, there is where our heart is also. He wants us, Christ wants us to follow him freely and have our treasure in heaven. May our freedom not be encumbered by our wealth or by any other thing. May we, with God's help, become true stewards of all that God has given us. May we become more and more like our Lord and be rich in mercy, in generosity, and love. Amen.